This is the summary of the book, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Introduction. The greatest show on earth. When it comes to money, your emotional intelligence becomes more crucial than your IQ. Money doesn't follow the traditional rules or laws like that of physics, rather it is more oriented towards how well you manage your emotions. Any ordinary person without any formal education and having sound emotional control over self might perform better than a genius lacking only in emotional control over money. A janitor could amass a fortune if he could save some small amount regularly and even a highly paid executive could go bankrupt by spending on unnecessary things. Financial success is a soft skill where how you behave is more important than what you know. In many situations, you might have to battle against your emotional and mental state which might affect your planned response. To grasp why people bury themselves in debt you don't need to study interest rates, you need to study the history of greed, insecurity, and optimism. Chapter 1. No one's crazy. Your personal experiences with money make up maybe 0.0000000001% of what's happened in the world, but maybe 80% of how you think the world works. Each individual has his own set of experiences that shape his views about how the world works. For example, if you were born in 1950, the stock market was flat during your teens and twenties, adjusted for inflation. If you were born in 1970, the S&P 500 increased 1,000% during your teens and twenties, adjusted for inflation. These two groups of people, born in different years, go through life with a completely opposite view of how the stock market works. The challenge for us is that no amount of studying or open-mindedness can genuinely recreate the power of fear and uncertainty. Some lessons have to be experienced before they can be understood. If you have experienced a recession, you would be having a lesser appetite for risk and more tendency to save. Knowing about recession, without experiencing, would not help you in comprehending its effects. Emotions weigh more than facts when it comes to money and this is reflected in people's behavior. Low-income households in America spend around $400 per year on lottery tickets. While this might look crazy to those in the higher income group, this is the only way for them to get a huge amount of money. No one is crazy. We behave based on our past financial experiences which most people develop in their early adult life. Chapter 2. Luck and Risk. Luck and risk are both the reality that every outcome in life is guided by forces other than individual effort. They both happen because the world is too complex to allow 100% of your actions to dictate 100% of your outcomes. The accidental impact of actions outside of your control can be more consequential than the ones you consciously take. It's hard to quantify luck when you are judging someone's financial success. Be careful who you praise and admire. Be careful who you look down upon and wish to avoid becoming. Focus less on specific individuals and case studies and more on broad patterns. Extreme outcomes are low probability outcomes. Applying the lessons of those who achieved these outlier results isn't always helpful since external forces of luck and risk may have played immeasurable and non-replicable roles. Instead look at broad patterns that offer directional insights. The more common the pattern, the more applicable it might be to your life. When things are going well, don't think you are invincible because luck's cousin, risk, can turn your story around. Also, when you are losing, it doesn't mean you are terrible. Nothing is as good or as bad as it seems. Chapter 3. Never Enough. At a party given by a billionaire on Shelter Island, Kurt Vonnegut informs his pal, Joseph Heller, that their host, a hedge fund manager, had made more money in a single day than Heller had earned from his wildly popular novel Catch-22 over its whole history. Heller responds, yes, but I have something he will never have, enough. There is no reason to risk what you have and need for what you don't have and don't need. The hardest financial skill is getting the goalpost to stop moving. It makes no sense to strive for more if your expectations grow with results, as you'll feel the same once you achieve your newly set goals. Comparing ourselves to others is the problem here. Social comparison is a process without end. The ceiling of social comparison is so high that virtually no one will ever hit it. There are many things worth more than the gains from taking the risks like reputation, freedom, independence, family and friends, love. And your best shot at keeping these things is knowing when it's time to stop taking risks that might harm them. 
Knowing when you have enough. Happiness is just results minus expectations. Chapter 4. Confounding Compounding. Warren Buffett started investing at the age of 11. He amassed most of his wealth after he turned 50. He is considered to be one of the greatest investors of our times. Effectively all of Warren Buffett's financial success can be tied to the financial base he built in his pubescent years and the longevity he maintained in his geriatric years. His skill is investing, but his secret is time. Good investing isn't necessarily about earning the highest returns. It's about earning pretty good returns that you can stick with and which can be repeated for the longest period of time. That's when compounding runs wild. Chapter 5. Getting Wealthy versus Staying Wealthy. There are many ways to acquire wealth, but there's only one way to stay wealthy, some combination of frugality and paranoia. Getting money requires taking risks, being optimistic and putting yourself out there. Keeping money requires the opposite. It requires humility, and fear that what you've made can be taken away from you just as fast. We can't assume that yesterday's success translates into tomorrow's good fortune. We need to develop a survival mindset. It means developing the ability to stick around for a long time without wiping out or being forced to give up. Aim for unbreakable finance, stay in the game for long enough for compounding to work room for error, a good plan leaves room for error, margin of safety. The more you need specific elements of a plan to be true, the more fragile your financial plan becomes. Be optimistic about the future but paranoid about the obstacles in the journey. Ch Chapter 6, Tales, You Win. Good definition of an investing genius is the man or woman who can do the average thing when all those around them are going crazy. Tales drive everything. Anything that is huge, profitable, famous, or influential is the result of a tail event, an outlying one in thousands or millions event. Venture capital model relies on this. If a fund makes 100 investments, they expect 80% to fail, a handful of them to do reasonably well and expects 1 to 2 to drive the fund's returns. Similarly, in the stock market, most public companies fail, some do okay and only a few generate extraordinary returns. Chapter 7, Freedom. Money gives you the ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want, for as long as you want. Controlling your time is the highest dividend money pays. The highest form of wealth is the ability to wake up every morning and say, I can do whatever I want today. Having a strong sense of controlling one's life is a more dependable predictor of positive feelings of well-being than any of the objective conditions of life we have considered. Chapter 8, Man in the Car Paradox. When you see someone driving a nice car, you rarely think about the guy driving the car. Rather, you think if you had the car people would think you are cool. There is a paradox here, people tend to want wealth to signal to others that they should be liked and admired. But in reality those other people often bypass admiring you, not because they don't think wealth is admirable, but because they use your wealth as a benchmark for their own desire to be liked and admired. No one is impressed with your possessions as much as you are. Chapter 9, Wealth is what you don't see. Wealth is financial assets that haven't yet been converted into the stuff you see. When someone buys a new car worth $100,000, they are left with $100,000 less than they had before buying the car. We judge wealth by what we see, because that's the only information we have in front of us. We cannot see other people's bank statements to measure their wealth. When people say they want to be millionaires, what they really mean is that they want to be able to spend a million dollars. There is a huge difference between being wealthy and being rich. Rich is your current income. Living in big homes, driving fancy cars depicts you are rich. Wealth is hidden, it's income not spent. The value of wealth lies in offering you options, flexibility and growth to one day purchase more stuff than you could right now. Spending money to show people how much money you have is the fastest way to lose money. Chapter 10, Save Money. Building wealth has little to do with your income or investment returns, and lots to do with your savings rate. You can build wealth without a high income, but have no chance of building wealth without a high savings rate. Your investment returns could make you rich but the results are uncertain whereas personal savings and frugality are more in your control and have a 100% chance of being as effective in the future as they are today. Learning to be happy with less money creates a gap between what you have and what you want, similar to the gap you get from growing your paycheck, but easier and more in your control. 
Past a certain level of income, what you need depends only on your ego. Chapter 11. Reasonable, Rational. Do not aim to be coldly rational when making financial decisions. Aim to just be pretty reasonable. Reasonable is more realistic and you have a better chance of sticking with it for the long run, which is what matters most when managing money. A rational investor makes decisions based on numerical facts. A reasonable investor considers the impact of the decision on his spouse, his family, his co-workers. The reasonable investors love their technically imperfect strategies as they are more likely to stick to them. Chapter 12. Surprise. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. It is smart to have a deep appreciation for economic and investing history. History helps us calibrate our expectations, study where people tend to go wrong, and offers a rough guide of what tends to work. But it is not, in any way, a map of the future. We cannot rely on history to predict the future. No historian is a prophet who could predict the future with great certainty. Focusing on the history and past patterns may cause overlooking outlier events that move the needle. Misguiding the present as the past doesn't account for structural changes relevant in today's world. Chapter 13. Room for Error. The purpose of the margin of safety is to render the forecast unnecessary. You can never predict what the future holds. When you give yourself the room for error, you are planning for any uncertainty, randomness or unknown chances that might occur. Increase your gap between what you think will happen and what can happen. Plan on your plan not going according to the plan. Single point of failure when many things rely on one thing to work properly and that one thing breaks, the whole system fails. The biggest single point of failure with money is a sole reliance on a paycheck to fund short-term spending needs, with no savings to create a gap between what you think your expenses are and what they might be in the future. Chapter 14. You'll change. We are poor forecasters of our future selves. Imaging a goal is easy and fun, but imaging it in the context of realistic life stresses that grow as life happens is entirely different. The end of history illusion is what psychologists call the tendency for people to be keenly aware of how much they've changed in the past, but to underestimate how much their personalities, desires, and goals are likely to change in the future. Except that as an individual you are prone to change. What matters to you today might become obsolete in the future. Assuming that you'll be happy with simple life even with low earnings or choosing to work for endless hours to gain wealth increases the chances of you regretting this in future. Thus, you should avoid extreme financial planning. Chapter 15. Nothing's free. Successful investing demands a price. But its currency is not dollars and cents. It's volatility, fear, doubt, uncertainty, and regret, all of which are easy to overlook until you're dealing with them in real time. If you want to get a 11% annual return till your retirement, you must be willing to face the volatility that the market offers, big returns in a short period of time and losses even faster. The price that you pay for these is often unnoticeable. When you are investing for the long term, you should be willing to accept short-term volatility. Consider it as a fee rather than a fine. Chapter 16. You and Me. Investors often innocently take cues from other investors who are playing a different game than they are. Bubbles aren't so much about valuations rising. That's just a symptom of something else, time horizons shrinking as more short-term traders enter the playing field. Bubbles form when more money is added for mostly short-term prospects instead of mostly long-term prospects. Bubbles do their damage when long-term investors playing one game start taking their cues from those short-term traders playing another. Every investor has different goals and different views, so what might work for someone else might not work for you. So understand your time horizon and avoid taking financial cues from others. Chapter 17. The Seduction of Pessimism. Optimism is a belief that the odds of a good outcome are in your favor over time, even when there will be setbacks along the way. Pessimism just sounds smarter and more plausible than optimism. When compared, losses seem much larger than the gains. In stock markets, a 10% decline is flashed everywhere but a 10% gain gets no attention. Because of evolution, we treat threats as more urgent than opportunities. Tell someone that everything will be great and they're likely to either shrug you off or offer a skeptical eye. Tell someone they're in danger and you have their undivided attention. Growth is driven by compounding which is slow and takes time whereas destruction happens in an instant. 
Chapter 18. When you'll believe anything, the world is driven by stories. The more you want something to be true, the more likely you are to believe a story that overestimates the odds of it being true. Everyone has an incomplete view of the world. But we form a complete narrative to fill in the gaps. We try to understand the past by explaining the events as they unfolded. This gives us an illusion that we understand how the world works. And this leads to mistakes. Rather than accepting that we don't understand things, we try to develop personal theories which is psychologically comforting. The illusion of control is more persuasive than the reality of uncertainty. This is end of summary.